سهلا فيكم بالاردن يا مرحبا حياكم الله ويلكم تو جوردن ويلكم تو ذا بيجينينغ اوف ذا بيج جوردن ادفنتشر سو ذيس تايم ا ديفرنت بارت اوف ذا وورلد ديفرنت كالتشر لانجويج ريليجن so it's kind of plunging into deeper waters this time although people say that when it comes to arab muslim countries jordan is the most accessible to uh, the general western viewers and probably it is so considering all the marvelous things we can visit here and people do visit them petra for example right so i imagine it is true but the thing is when you start looking at it from a bit of a distance so to speak we go to jordan but we do not go for jordan what we visit there are things that somebody built on the territory of today's state of jordan but do we actually visit places connected to the country it's only a hundred years old when you think about it and we i guess never really get into the topic so when i started reading turns out there are plenty of interesting issues so we are going to obviously visit the famous important things and places but also i'm going to try to dig deeper into politics economy social issues and the such uh, concerning the country and the people who live here of course those who build it not necessarily all of them were locals so we're gonna get into those topics we may actually touch on a um, taboo or two let's see what happens um, but um, i have high hopes for um, for the jordanian issues hence three weeks ago which is kind of late when you think about it i also started learning arabic so let's see how that works out anyway let me take you now without further ado to the map and when i say take you to the map unfortunately i still don't understand technology i still have no idea how to create a proper map an interactive version of course so um, still the partisan version but let me take you to it straight up now here you have the northern part of Jordan. So I am going to meet Vicky in a place that you can see straight up in the capital Amman. And then we are going to visit from the north all the way down to the south. And you can see already some uh, places are marked. And when I say all the way down to the south, to the Red Sea itself, and then we're gonna go probably uh, up a different route up to Amman again because from there we are going to fly home but I am here for a week alone because I think you can perfectly see it here people live in the West actually 85% of the country has only 5% of inhabitants. For example, what about this weird panhandle, so to speak, kind of between Iraq, Saudi Arabia and Syria? Well, alone, I will spend a week here, where nobody lives and nobody goes. But we are going to start with this little town right here. We are going to Mafrak. But first of all, in order to go there, we have to take a minibus and the mode of transport plus the type of people that you see here will tell you something about the town itself already. 
this is not a touristic town, this is a proper town where you live, you have to work to feed your family, there's no time to fool around or anything. This is exactly the type of place I wanted to visit, which is great, so I started um, straight up recording. Not from the gimbal, just with the phone in my hand, but I showed you the name of the town with a little recording where I also took a photo. And when taking the photo, those two ladies that you see on the left of the photo went into it. And the one dressed in a bit, uh, a bit in black started shouting at me because she thought I'm taking a photo of her, not the sign. Which is great that it happened so quickly, because for a time now I was thinking of uh, an experiment. Instead of simply walking around with the camera in my hand, I decided to put the camera in the pocket in my sweater. Well, I think it comes as no revelation that when people see a camera, they don't behave naturally. And this is something, I guess, intercultural. But here is an extra thing. People in this part of Jordan are supposedly very traditional. And this is one of the first things I noticed. The lady in the photo, she wasn't the only one dressed in black. Many women here are wearing a burqa or a niqab. No single woman I saw had um, her hair out. All of them had somehow is covered. Plus the men. I never saw a man in a t-shirt or shorts, so both sexes, their bodies are pretty much fully covered. This is indeed a traditional place. So walking around a town like this with a camera out, I, um, I kind of expected two extremes. One extreme is the men would swarm me, all of them would want to be in the shot. Women would escape from me not to be in the picture and both are not good both are definitely not natural reactions so I thought when and where if not here and now so this is pretty much what I did and I have to say I'm kind of proud of the uh, first experiment I know two things now I have to learn to walk in such a way that the camera doesn't go up and down all the time plus so that you can actually see what's in front of me not to decide Anyway, the experiment is done and I hope you agree, it's not that bad. So probably I'm gonna do a mix of both. I'm gonna use this and try to perfect it, plus from time to time I am going to try um, to simply walk around with a camera. Let's see what happens. In the meantime though, enjoy another very typical thing of this part of the world. So here you have another very important piece of local culture which is going to keep on popping up during our stay I guess. But to finish the walk around town let me tell you why we are here in the evening when not much is happening really. Well I was not in town during the day. So let me take you now a bit out of the center to the local bus station. And uh, here we are. The locals see me from afar, they start waving, they start calling me, so I come, and they keep calling, and I keep coming, they keep calling, I keep coming, and then... And then you have to know one important detail, there is no timetable, the bus leaves when it's full. So they were calling me, but it did not want to get full, so I had to wait for an hour. Hence, the best plan here is to have no plan. Instead of plans, what you need here is plenty of patience. But then again, this is also a part of a local experience. One good thing about bus stations, they, they are great for people watching. So that's what I did. I just sat down, waited patiently and watched people walk by. So let me also use this place for one extra detail. I told you I started learning Arabic three weeks with the famous Duolingo. So let me tell you here straight up. Three weeks with Duolingo prepares you pretty much for nothing. 
When you learn online, you learn something called modern standard Arabic. Well, here people speak their own dialect, so I pretty much hit a metaphorical linguistic wall. But I am not giving up, let's see what happens in the future. In the meantime, the minibus finally filled up and off we go to a little place roughly 10 kilometers out of Mafrak. Maybe the town itself has officially nothing touristic to offer, but all you need to do is just look around a bit. Welcome to a place which is for a ruined geek like me a little uh, a bit of a paradise I would say. Welcome to well, first of all, this is a place roughly 10 kilometers away from Mafrak. But because nobody really comes to Mafrak, nobody really comes here. And it's literal. I spent, before recording, around two hours walking around here. Not a person. I am literally alone here. So if you one day go to Petra and you think it's expensive, keep in mind, it is expensive because Petra pays for this. This place cannot pay its own bills. Let's have that clear. And when I keep saying this place, officially the name is Umal Jimal, which is basically the mother of camels. Now, I did not see camels here, a bit of a different animal as you can see, but camels used to roam the ruins and supposedly they still roam around. Supposedly, people who live around here, they still make their living um, from camels. So there must be something in it. And the name, a modern name of a nearby village is used because we actually don't know the Roman or a Byzantine or any other name of this town. If we come to such ruins, we always think, my God, they're so amazing. And they are to us. But back in the day, what we are walking around was just a little town like hundreds of others. So nobody really cared. Nobody recorded names here. So we don't know. And the names, well, they could be in many languages. It is the Nabataeans who supposedly started proper towns here 2000 years ago. And there is Nabataean scripture around here. Of course, there's going to be Latin, as it was Roman Empire. Greek, mostly, because actually Latin here wasn't used. Greek was the main language. And of course, then the Byzantine Empire. It is Greek again. And then after Islam conquers, well, there's going to be Arabic. But actually, there are here even examples of pre-Islamic Arabic. As we tend to think, Roman Empire, it's the Romans. Well, people who lived here were locals. They were Arabs, essentially. And Arabs spoke Arabic before Islam as well. And there's a little garden of languages here, which is a pretty cool place. I can tell you Greek when it's Greek. I cannot tell you the languages uh, locally used, if, the, if everything's right or not. No idea. But I trust them that it's as it should be. So, we are going to visit plenty of important places. We're going to go to obviously some amazing Roman ruins and obviously we're gonna go to Petra at least two days if not three there but there's gonna be a bit of uh, Byzantine times there's gonna be the early Islamic states there's gonna be the Crusaders so plenty of history awaiting us and grand but now that we are here let me take you for a little walk around now first thing let's deal with the rock i think it's the first thing that you notice the whole city is built of this black rock well this is basalt so in short solidified lava across the modern border in syria there is an extinct volcano fortunately extinct because back in the day when it erupted you can still see it for tens of kilometers around so expect more in the future but at least all the people here had plenty of building material and when I say all the people, the Romans. Well, this gate unfortunately did not survive. It was the representative one having at the top a Latin inscription. Unfortunately, nothing survived. At least here is a little reconstruction of the inscription. Another very important symbol of power was the Praetorium. And again, well, this is how it looked like. Did not really survive either. And one more symbol of Roman power, something that you see straight up when you enter the site, the barracks. And then, after the Romans, 
the Byzantine Empire, well, they decided no more barracks. It actually became kind of a monastery, we can say. And talking about monastery, the churches, well, ruins of the churches did survive pretty well. And let me here just touch upon a very interesting topic, the Islamic conquest. We very often think through dates. So one day, Islam conquered part of the Byzantine Empire and people believe that Christians disappeared one day, second day it's all Islam. Things don't work that way. Here, people were Christian after Islamic conquest for quite a long time. So not only that for a long time the churches survived, but also they actually built several little churches a hundred years after the Islamic conquest. No problem. So you can still see some of the ruins pretty well. And here we have... Um, let's call it the cathedral, the biggest of the churches of the town. This is actually a topic I'm going to go deeper into uh, at a later stage, but keep it in mind. Now we talk about Islamic conquest. Of course, there are symbols of it as well. This was supposedly a caravanserai. So think of it as a kind of a five star hotel of the day. Now, unfortunately, also didn't survive. Plus, Maybe the most important thing, the people here. Now we are going to enter a courtyard. And uh, supposedly the idea here is the courtyard is communal. And there are uh, people living around, usually 10 to 20 families. Here, uh, my guess is 20. The courtyard is big. And those families are tied by blood. So it's either a clan or a tribe, however you call it, the... Um, the important tie is the blood here and supposedly till the modern times in bigger uh, Arab cities that's how they would build things and that's another topic we are going to cover extensively the uh, tribal and the blood identities of uh, the local people but in the meantime the highlights of the place well my favorite highlight this door is made of basalt and supposedly it actually works. I tend to break things, so I'm not trying if it works or not because I don't want to break a beautiful door that's 1,600 years old. But as we continue, here's something weird, right? There are arches below our level. Well, here's another topic that is going to keep popping up all the time. Those arches were supporting a roof over a water reservoir so it keeps cool and clean and obviously if we are in a desert the issue of water is going to be a constant so when you walk around the town like this there are plenty of holes in the ground all of them were water reservoirs unfortunately also in a ruined state of course they were not like that originally would you like to see how it looked like? Well, here's a reconstruction. It was all plastered, so the water does not sip into the ground. You don't lose it. So what you see here is a reconstruction because it's not Islamic conquest or anything. It's in a ruined state because of an earthquake or actually a set of earthquakes, which is a plague of this part of the world. As I'm recording, it's only a month after the huge earthquake in Turkey, which destroyed modern towns. Thousands of people are dead. So imagine same thing would happen back in the day. So there was a set of huge earthquakes, the biggest in the middle of the 8th century, and that's what destroyed the town. Fortunately, what we see today is the work of archaeologists very often. There were actually more ruins, but they started piecing it all together. And there are still plenty of pieces waiting to be assembled. So if anybody used to love Lego as a child, here's your opportunity. Become an archaeologist. And of course, unavoidable. I love posting photos of people who used to work here. Here they are uh, chipping away the earth. And mind you, they have plenty to chip away. Those are all the layers that you can uh, go through in the place. So let me show you one extra modern layer. Late 19th century, the so-called Druze started living here. Supposedly, if you see an arch like this, or a kind of smart ventilation, that's a modern addition by the Druze. And now that I mentioned them, this is another story we are going to talk about immigration to modern Jordan lands. So, that's my face after the visit. 
but unfortunately not for long. Because when I talk about immigration to modern Jordan lands, just several kilometers out of the ruins is a place called Zaatari. Well, there's a village, but next to the village is the refugee camp for the Syrians escaping from the civil war. There was a moment where, uh, when 150,000 people lived there. Now it's in the brackets only 80,000. So this is the fourth or fifth biggest in the brackets city in Jordan. And mind you, Mafrak. 10 years ago was 100,000 people. Now it's 200,000. In 10 years it doubled. And one of the restaurants where I ate, four waiters, three were Syrians. Now excuse me that the footage is not exactly the best quality. It's from the minibus, but I couldn't simply stop, walk around and take photos because it's all guarded by the military and the police. Anyway, that's another topic I would love to get deeper into. Let's see what happens. And another unfortunate detail for the end, um, a plague of mm, so-called developing countries everywhere you will see trash. And I'm very sorry, but I have to show it once and I won't comment on it anymore. So that's pretty much it when it comes to the introduction, especially those of you who just stumbled upon me right now. Now I think it's obvious what you can expect. And those of you who follow me already, well, nothing new which is maybe bad but i hope you also agree with me it's for the better um, but mind you it's not going to be only history and uh, social political issues there's going to be something for the soul or maybe better for the body yep the obvious things and maybe less obvious i never smoked a cigar in my life officially well, maybe for in reality, but uh, you need to get deeper into the local culture, right? So prepare. This is my first shisha, first argila. So there it is, nervous and everything, and and nothing. It's actually quite a tasty thing, really. I got into it rather quickly, as you can see, full on. Anyway, there's going to be a bit of everything, as it should be. Now, talking about a bit of everything, how do you like the um, background? It's kind of nice and green. I'm very happy here in the shade. There's actually a very nice garden right next to me. But that's what you see. What I see is something different. Let me switch the focus of the camera for a moment. According to the introduction, this is what I see. What about this? I am going to tell you in the next episode. For now, thank you very much, and I will see you very, very soon, my friends.